And thank you for being here. We've got a great crowd this morning. I'm glad we're all together sharing and, and being together in fellowship. Just a reminder, we do have the scrubbers on, thanks to um, Walter and installing that. So the air is being scrubbed and cleaned as we speak. And so, um, yeah, thank you, Walter. Appreciate it, buddy. Yeah. So that makes it a little bit, you know, a little bit safer, we hope. The ventilation system is always good throughout this pandemic. But, but we do welcome each and every one here and those who are at home and hunker down. We thank you for participating and worshiping with us as well and glad you are part uh, with us in worship. If you have any needs, please let us know. Also to remind you, it's always good as you, if you're on Facebook to kind of uh, do a little bit of interacting with us so we can see who's all participating with us. Uh, just being online watching is one thing, but sometimes making a few comments lets us know who you are and where you are uh, because it's kind of important that we keep up with one another uh, and, and know, know the needs of our congregation as well as our virtual congregation that's out there. So uh, thank you again, and let's worship the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessings on us as we worship today. Father, we thank you that you give us opportunity to be able to, to, to understand each other, but understand more importantly what we all have in common, and it's the fact of who the Lord Jesus Christ is to all of us as being Lord and Savior of our life. We worship you, we honor you, we recognize you as, as Lord and King. And may everything we do in this service and through this worship time together be that which blesses your name, that lifts you up, that recognizes you as the God that you are in control of this world and control of our own individual lives. Father, we thank you that, that even in all of this pandemic and all the things that we have and all the cares and concerns and anxiety, the sickness and all this, we still realize that you are our great physician, you are the provider and caregiver of our lives and we cast our lives before you and we thank you beforehand. Uh, for your care and your provision. Now, may, may you understand our love in a very beautiful way today that we love you, we worship you, we honor you, and we adore you. In your name that we pray, amen.
pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today with a great crowd here at to worship at our church and also want to welcome everybody in the virtual crowd too. As we go through our tithes and offerings today, we will give a penance back to you for all the blessings you've given to us. But we pray that you will glorify this in our hearts and we will share that with the world around us, not only our community, but throughout the world. We pray this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Today that that you realize that 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 God is good and He loves you so and he, and He wants to alleviate in your own heart and mind and to lift the burdens that you have so that you can live life on a lighter foot with an easier heart and a mind focused on Him and so today's message is entitled "Cast Your Burden." On the Lord. It's found in Psalm 55, verses 16 through 23. They give the context before we read this. I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but the first part of that chapter, David is giving a little bit of history about his life. What happened was that his best friend Absalom had turned against him, and Ahithophel, which was also a part of the equation, which turns out to be the uncle to Bathsheba. 
Now, we know that being important because of David's uh, life and the things that he did. And what's happening to David is that the two people who was, he was in alignment with are now two people who have turned against him. And David is feeling as if his world has come crashing down. That the people that, that was his alliance and the people that was his support are the people that now are fighting against him to take over his throne. And so it, he's finding himself not only disappointed, but he finds himself alone. And he finds himself, his anxiety level rises because he feels as if there's no one around him now to uplift him and support him in a human standpoint. And so he's casting his head down a little low and he's getting a little bit angry and he's also facing some questions. What do I do now when the people who loved me have all deserted me? And so he's placing himself before God. And we learn from this psalm that there are a few things that David says that gives us indication of why he is a man after God's own heart. And in Psalm 55, verse 16, he says, But I call to God. The Lord will save me. So he's, he's shared all this up in this context in this chapter of everything that's happened to him, the fears and the anxieties and the troubles that he's faced. He comes to the conclusion in verse 16, But I call to God because he will save me. He says, I complain and I groan morning, noon, and night. He's almost reminding God, I understand I'm a pest right now, God, because I am groaning, I'm complaining every moment of the day. I understand that. And then he goes on to say, but God hears my voice. Through, though many are against me, now he's, you know, when you're going through a situation, he's overgeneralizing the statement here. There's only a few people against him at this point in his life, but he feels as if everyone is against him. And so here he says, though many are against me, he, God, will redeem me from my battle unharmed. We know it's a battle he's going through emotionally, a battle that we all identify because we face those same battles. God, the one enthroned from long ago, will hear and will humiliate them because they do not change and do not fear God. You know, the, the sad part about it is those who are doing evil are obviously not in alignment with God's will, and David knows that something in judgment is going to come upon their life. And then he says in verse 20, he acts violently against those at peace with him. He violates his covenant. His buttery words are smooth, but war is in his heart. His words are softer than oil, but they are drawn swords. And this is the key. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will support you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. You, God, will bring them down to the pit of destruction. Men of bloodshed, treachery, will not live out half their days. But I, but I, David, I will trust in the Lord. Now, when you go back to verse 22, cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will support you. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, verse 6 and 7 together, it says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that he will exalt you in due time, casting your care, singular, casting your care upon you, upon him, because he cares for you. Cast your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. And so you, took, you, you look at these two verses, verse 22 of Psalm 55 and chapter, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, and you begin to draw a conclusion here. There's something about burden casting. There's something about releasing things from our life so that we can live our life in freedom from the battle of the emotions that seem to weight us down. Now, we of all, all over the world, many of us have, have tapped into emotions that's been completely different than we've ever known in our lifetime because of the pandemic. We've gone through fear. We've gone through the emotion of, 
of sadness. We've gone through the emotion of grief from those who have lost loved ones. We've gone through the emotion of, of trying to, you know, questioning what's next. We've gone through the emotion of anger. We've gone through the emotion of, well, let's just let our hair down and forget about it. We've gone through all sorts of emotions up and down trying to listen to those who are in leadership and those who have authority and trying to give us what's best and the next step. And we learned that not even the leaders of the world know what's happening in this pandemic as it's changed from week to week. And we've gone through all those emotions. So we asked the question, does God understand our emotions? Absolutely. Does God understand the burden that I'm carrying in my heart? Absolutely. Now, the, if he understands it, now the next question is, what can happen if I give him that care and I give him that burden or I give him that emotion? What will God do when I cast it toward him? Now, when I think of casting, I'm automatically standing on the, on the bank of a pond or a lake. And I'm reaching back and I've got my bait on my hook and I cast that, that, that bait, I cast that hook into the water. And I stand there patiently and I wait for something to grab a hold of the hook. The exhilaration as a young child catching their first little brim in a small pond to that of catching a very large fish in the deeper waters is just as exciting today as it was as a little child. There's something about the catch. You can't see it. You can't make the fish grab a hold of the hook. But when it does, you jerk it. It grabs a hold of the fish and you begin to reel him in. And you see the catch that you have. Every one of us knows that the catch is huge if we're all by ourselves. It's the biggest fish that we've ever caught in our life if we're all by ourselves. And so we struggle and we reel them in. Well, the question is, can we take this burden and cast it and give it to God and stand there patiently for Him to take the care that we give Him and allow Him to do what only He can do with what we throw at him. The question is in an affirmative, yes, God can do the miraculous. The problem is we say that we cast it, but we leave the string attached and we reel it back in because we just can't let it go. So it comes a time in our life if you're going to follow the, the subscription of Psalm 55 verse 22, and 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. If you're going to follow that prescription of what to do, you're going to have to agree together. We're, we're, together, we're going to have to agree that we've got to cast it, we've got to throw it far from us, turn our back on it, and let God do the rest. And watch Him do something beautiful. So, in the end, David says to himself, cast your care Cast your burden upon the Lord. He may, have, he may have understood that God can get him out of a situation, but I don't think it's about just helping David to become a better David. It's about David coming to the realization that God is good and God is capable and God is able and God is ready and God is willing to take whatever care problem that David has and he's going to alleviate him and he's going to give him a lighter foot to travel. He's going to relieve his heart so that he can once again have a man after God's own heart. It's not just so that David would feel better. It's so that David would be strongly connected in relationship to Jehovah God, that he would be connected in such a way that he knew that God was, he was Lord of his kingship, that he was Lord of his nation, that he was Lord of his life, that he was Lord of his decisions, that he was Lord of his emotion, that he was Lord of everything in David's life. Even though the best friends of his life have deserted him, David, God knew that David needed to understand the best friend that he'd ever have is the Lord God himself. And so he's, he's, he's teaching David about casting his care upon the Lord. 
Guys, you need to, I need to, cast our care upon God. When you're given the phone call in an unexpected way of something terrible that's happened in your life, or maybe the news from a doctor, you've got to realize that it's not about you at that point. It's about what is God teaching me through this experience from what I'm now experiencing of the unexpected and what can happen to me that could be even greater beyond whatever this tragedy is in my life. God's given us a challenge. What are you going to do with the burden? What are you going to do with the care that's weighting you down in your life? Cast your care upon Him. Why? Because He cares for you. He loves you so. He understands you and I more than we could ever imagine. David said, I will call upon the Lord. This was the movement in the right direction from the devastation of dealing with the the failed relationships that were around him. He has decided to seek the Lord's help. And he closes this psalm by saying, I will trust in you. Not only will I call upon you, not only will I cast my care upon you, I will trust in you. So he's finally come to a place of confidence in this psalm and a place of trust. So what can we learn from David's experience? Let me give you some lessons for our heart this morning based on this psalm. First of all, burdens are common to life. You've got to realize that none of us are exempt from burdens. None of us are exempt from the anxieties that weighed us down. None of us are exempt from the troubles that happen in life. We've got to understand that burdens are a common part of life. And, and that what is a burden? What is the thing that I can cast on the Lord? How did David understand that admonition from his own heart? A burden is something that presses life down something that tests our humanity, that makes us aware of the need of God's help. And so it may be of some comfort to remember that the man who has, was after God's own heart was not immune to deep burdens of his own life. They come to all of us. You're not the only one. I'm not the only one dealing with a burden this day. But collectively together we have something in common that we can all agree that we need to be more of the casting of our burdens from us than holding on to the burdens within us. So let me give you those common burdens of life, the burdens that are common to life. Let me give you a few of those to think about that I think you and I together can agree that we all have these things. It's a part of who we are. First of all, the burdens common to life is the anxiety-producing circumstance is a burden. So you say, well, my anxiety is high today, and, and I'm dealing with a little bit of stress. I'm dealing with maybe a little bit of fear because of it. The anxiety-producing circumstance is a burden. It's not something that you need to hang on to. It's not something that you wake up and say, okay, I'm dealing with this anxiety. I know it's here. So therefore, I'm just going to deal with it because I'm a strong person and I don't need any help through it. That's the wrong attitude. The the attitude is is to recognize that this anxiety-producing circumstance in my life right now is a burden that I need to cast outward from me. And I don't need to reel it back in. I need to let it stay in the deep waters and let God deal with what he needs to deal with in that producing, stress-producing moment, circumstance of my life. A burden should be related to anxiety. A burden is something that fills our heart with anxiety. It fills our heart with the compassionate care that bothers us to the point and it begins to worry us that it drives us crazy. Have you ever had something on your mind and you have a sleepless night and you wait and you finally get up and the sun comes up and you think, you know, this was the most restless night that I've ever had. Why is that? 
Is it really because you had a restless night or I had a restless night? Or is it something that you've let plague on, our, on your mind like I have been time to time? And we let it run over and over and over through our mind. What's happening with the anxiety producing circumstance affects us while we sleep or try to sleep and we wake up the next morning we realize, Dad, blame it. If I would have just done it 12 hours ago, I would have cast this burden upon God and I would have slept like a little baby. We wake up and realize I haven't casted it. I haven't recognized that I need help through it. It's okay. It's not a weakness to say to God, help me. I can't deal with this anxiety. It has risen in my life and it's attacking me. For David, it was a literal attack of, 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 of Absalom, the, the great best friend of his life the one he embraced with, with the deep inner thoughts of his life, the one that he, he helped to, uh, or Absalom helped him to realize that there is more to life than just being a king. There are friendships that, are, that matter most. You've got to surround yourself with the people who love you and care for you. And David did that and Absalom fails him. So that anxiety producing moment, that burden in David's life is driving him crazy. It's, he's groaning, mourning, Noon and night. What is he saying? I have sleepless nights. I can't let this go. It's bothering me to the point that it's holding me back to being the king that I was called to be. And I can't be that person that I'm designed to be because this anxiety producing circumstance of my life is taking hold of my life. And it's not until David realizes the importance of casting, throwing that burden away from himself and giving it to God. You know, it's, he, he understands the significant opposition that has arisen to his rule as a king. That opposition being led by his very close friend, Absalom. And Ahithophel, his counsel, was greatly affected as well. So it's basically... His, if, you, if you want to put it in terms to understand how close these relationships were, it's like David's the president, Absalom is his vice president, and Ahithophel is his secretary of state. It is those three people that do a lot of things in leadership. And so this close alignment has now failed him. And he's thinking, what am I going to do? David states it like this, for it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it if that was the case back in verse 12 and 14 that we didn't read. He said, if it's one who hates me and, and, and has magnified himself against me, he said, if, if it's, that's all it was, then I can hide from it. I can deal with it. He said, but it's not. My own equal, my own companion, my own acquaintance, the one that I took sweet counsel in, he says, walk together into the worship of the Lord God who is on his throne. These people have failed me. His anxiety-producing circumstance is beyond him, his control. This was David's situation, and this is what he was facing. You may be, I may be in that same similar situation as others around us, the decisions we've made greatly help to complicate our lives because of the painful turn and the unexpectedness that has occurred in those relationships. I remember a dear friend who came to me with a heart full of anxiety. He had trusted all his retirement funds, everything, 500 plus thousand dollars entrusted into this one little company. And the company went bankrupt one year into his full retirement, 500 something thousand dollars just disappeared. He and his wife were at the point, what do we do now? We've worked all our lives to get to this moment to live the rest of our days in the awful pension fund and there's nothing there but Social Security. Anxiety producing situation became innumerable. Yet, yet some face it in divorce. Some face it when a son or daughter is having trouble. Some face it when they're against a health challenge 
or maybe a threatening disease. On and on we go. Your life situation brings to you a burden that weighs you down. So what do you do? As David says, you cast that burden upon God. He can handle it. He's a big boy. He can take it. There's nothing too burdensome that God can't deal with, and there's nothing too large that he can't take from us. Second of all, is a, a, the burdens common to life. It's not only the anxiety-producing circumstance, but the anxiety-producing responsibility is a burden. The Hebrew word translated burden is interesting because it can be translated as a gift, an assignment, or a lot. So let's know that there is something more than just the anxiety-producing situation going on. The anxiety is heightened by the understanding that David has been assigned a responsibility unto God. And that has produced for him an anxiety moment because now his failed relationships have caused him to feel as if he's out there alone and he doesn't know what to do because he doesn't have that alignment anymore. He doesn't have that counsel anymore. He doesn't have that advice anymore. He doesn't have people standing there that got his back in his situation and he feels as if his leadership to the nation of Israel is about to fail. Anxiety producing responsibility can become a burden. And David felt the weight of being a king for the first time in his life. Wow, I'm out here all alone and no one stands with me. In fact, they stand against me. Everyone that I see is out to get me and take over this throne. And his anxiety producing responsibility has become a major burden in his life. And so the greatest burden that I've ever borne is the assignment when I realized I myself was called into the ministry to stand here Sunday after Sunday or meeting after meeting or study after study is an assignment that can produce for me a great anxiety and can become a burden if I allow the weight of that responsibility to overtake me. And if I try to do it myself, I'm going to fail not only myself and God, but you. It is a heavy responsibility that I carry as a pastor every day of life because I know that I sin. I know that I have problems in my own life. I put on my pants like anyone else. I deal with the same situation and same emotions as anyone else. And then that responsibility on top of that is a responsibility to God, to myself, to my family, and to the church. And so David is feeling, magnify that completely thousand times more. He's over a nation. And I can understand that burden. David said in his own heart, in verse 22, "'Cast your care upon God.'" Peter says, why should you even do that, David? Well, I'll help answer the question, David, because God cares for you. God cares about the burden. God cares about the anxiety-producing moment of your life. He cares so much that he wants us to get rid of it, and he wants us to give it to him so that he can take what looks like a wilted flower and bring it back to life to take what looks like dead grass and make it green again. He wants to take what looks like the dead of winter and bring sunshine in summer back to it. But he's not going to do it in our life until we cast that anxiety or that burden upon him. Third of all is an anxiety-producing memory is a burden. This probably is the downfall of all of us more than anything else. We beat ourselves up because of our memory. We understand the future is God, the future is forgiveness, the future is hope, the future is life, and it is abundant life, as well as the promise of everlasting life. We know that. Our faith directs us to that theological understanding of what we have belonging to God. But our memory says to us, how could I ever be above this in my life? 
because it will haunt me for the rest of my life. Our memory says you're no good because of the sin of your life. Our memory says that you can never be good enough for anybody else because of what you've done. The memory holds us back and it can be an anxiety producing memory that becomes a burden. We've got to cast the memory on God as well. Not only the actual problem and sin and anxiety moment of our life, we have to actually cast our memory on God. God, do you, can you take what's inside me and help me to forget it? Absolutely. I firmly believe forgiveness is not only forgiving someone to the point that we unwrap them and set them free, but I think it's also about forgetting the pain that we have felt because of what they've done. It's also forgiveness of ourselves is also wrapped up in the fact that I can forget what I've done in the past and focus more about what I can do in the future. And David was facing a memory. What was David's memory? As I said, Ahithophel is the uncle of Bathsheba. Every time his right-hand man, his secretary of the state of the nation, was there across from him or was beside him or was behind him or was before him or was in prayer with him, was in study with him, was the man to remind him, I violated your niece. And that memory could never leave him. And it has become an anxiety-producing memory that has become a burden in David's life. And so from that day forward, David carried that burden in the time of that allegiance with Ahithophel and Absalom and maybe had not realized until, until he really needed to that he needs to let go. When God says, I have removed your sin as far as the east is from the west, and I have cleaned you up, and I don't remember it anymore. It's gone. You need to do the same. Did he carry some secret of resentment to David? Maybe Ahithophel had due to what David had done. Possibly so. Was Ahithophel reminding David? Maybe over and over. We don't know. But something happened that helped David to feel helpless. So what do you do with those painful memories of the past? You cast your care upon him. Now let me, I made a comment when I read that scripture. It's not cast your cares upon him. It's singular. Cast your care upon him. Now what does that mean? We see our life as multiple things, multiple burdens. But the greatest burden that we could ever carry in life is to refuse to even throw those burdens on God. It's of one singular event of casting all that care, all that's within us, and to cast it upon God. So what do you do with those painful memories of the past? You cast them on God. He's the only one who can forgive the failures of the past and the only one who can make something good of the failures for the, from the past to the present. So cast that burden on the Lord and leave it there. A second lesson from the heart. That was really basically the introduction to the message. No, I'm just kidding. But the second point I want to make, going back to the lessons for our heart, we said the burdens are common to life. We talked about those burdens. That's those three anxiety-producing moments of our life. Now, second of all, the lessons for our heart is to cast your burden on the Lord, to actually cast your burden on the Lord. Now, the question is, as we look at 1 Peter, Peter adds, for he cares for you. Another translation says, why do you cast your care upon God? Because you matter to Him. I love that translation. You matter to Him. He, you, and God are important. God understands who we are as an individual. And I think it makes Him smile when we say, I can't handle this. I can't do this on my own. 
I'm casting this care, I'm casting this burden, I'm casting this problem, I'm casting this weighted situation of my life upon you because you realize that you and I matter to God. So the question remains, okay, I'll understand it, but how do I cast it? The question is now, how do I cast my care upon God? How do I actually do that? You're talking about throwing it in the deep water. You're talking about letting it go. That's one thing, but how do I do it? Well, I'm glad you asked because I've got an answer. Number one, it is the fact, number one has to be is acknowledging your weakness. Acknowledging the weakness of your life. The first step in throwing the burden on the Lord is the admission of our humanity where we are not designed to be sufficient in life without God. We learned that from the Garden of Eden, didn't we? Adam and Eve, what did they do? They rebelled against God. And it was designed that Adam and Eve stay connected with God in a perfect union and to not allow anything to interrupt that union. And they chose sin and therefore it interrupted the equation. It, it, it broke that relationship. It didn't sever it but there was a, a distance that was created, not because God left them, but because they had left God. And as a result of that, God had to work out the plan to put humanity back together because of the sin of the world, of the heart. And at that point, it was, it was, it was where God wanted Adam and Eve to recognize their weakness. You remember the story of Genesis when he cried out to Adam and Eve? And he says, Adam, where are you? Now, if Adam was any smart of a man, he'd probably be thinking, what do you mean, asking me where I'm at? God, you're God. <laughs> you know where I'm at. He wanted, he wanted Adam to realize where he was, that he was not in perfect union with God, that he broke that fellowship, that he chose something greater over God. And he wanted Adam to realize his weakness. He wanted Adam and Eve to realize that they needed something better. They needed something more than what they had done to break that relationship. Humble yourselves, therefore, before God. You're asking the question, how do I cast my care upon God? Humble yourselves before God under His mighty hand, realizing that He has power over our life. He has power over every anxiety-producing situation, responsibility, and memory of our life. To humble ourselves, therefore, under the, under the mighty hand of God so that He may lift us up in due time so that we no longer have to eat from the belly of the ground, that we can rise up and wash off the dirt of our, on our face because we cast all our anxiety upon Him, all our care upon Him because He cares for you. That's what Peter says. What we see as multiple anxieties, God sees it as one. And that one thing is, everything we're holding on to is singular. The various things that are in our hand are plural. But God says, take all the plurality and cast it singular upon me. And I can handle it. And I will lift you up by my mighty hand and bring you relief in your life. So acknowledge your weakness. Acknowledge that it's there. It's, it's all right to recognize your humanity. To be human means to be limited and to realize our limit, limitlessness. It means that we are finite. It means that there are burdens that are bigger than we can handle. In the wisdom of God, we're called on to face those circumstances that are bigger than we are, to carry the responsibility that are bigger than we are, to live with memories that are bigger than we are, and admit it. I can't do it alone. But there's also another person in this universe that is bigger than any burden, and he cares for us because we matter to him. He has our best interest in mind. 
So we've got to, first of all, acknowledge our weakness. Second of all, how do we cast that care upon him is to release it to the Lord by faith. To release it to the Lord by faith. You cannot cast something away and still hold on to it. This is something that's, and I, and I share this from, from a personal experience and a deep personal experience of my life back on March of, of about 10, almost 11 years ago. I stood on the seashore at the Myrtle Beach State Park on a winter day, very blustery, windy, cold March day. And I stood there all alone down to the furthest south entrance of the park. And I stood there on that shore with all the stuff that was built in my heart from all that I was, I was facing and feeling. And I stood there as a pastor. I reached into my heart figuratively and I said, God, if you want it, you can have it because I can't deal with this anymore. And I threw it away and literally speaking it out loud, throwing it out in the ocean figuratively for God just to sweep it away. No one around me, not a soul to the right, to the left, behind me or in front of me, all by myself. You just don't go to the beach when it feels like 40 degrees and the wind's kicking you right in the face. You stay home. You stay away from that cold breeze coming off the ocean. And then all of a sudden, this lady comes up behind me and says, Sir, I hate to interrupt you, but what were you singing? I said, Ma'am, I wasn't singing a thing. She said, Oh, yes, you were. There was beautiful music that I was hearing coming from your mouth. When I was casting my care upon him, releasing it, believing by faith that as I let it go, God was going to take care of it, that I could live in freedom, that I could be what I was called to be, I could do what I was called to do, that I could be fresh again, once again, filled with his spirit, that I knew by faith that day would be a changed day for me. So you've got to release it to the Lord. It means that I go forth to perform my responsibility and complete dependence on God. It means that even in my weakness, I have complete dependence upon God. He will not allow any suffering on my part to be wasted. Think about that. Whatever your burden is, turn loose of it. Let the living almighty God Get under your burden and take it away. Release it to the Lord. Number three of how you and I can cast our care upon him is first, is third of all, anticipate the Lord's response. You know, one of the organizations I've been a part of for many a year that goes back to 1985 is called the Walk to Emmaus. It's just a spiritual journey you go on and you, you, you have opportunity that's created for you to have a personal relationship, personal experience with God, and one-on-one. -on -one. But you do it in the group of other men. Ladies go with ladies, men go with men. And one of the things they tell you as you're going into the weekend, do not anticipate. Just let it happen. But today, I'm telling you to anticipate. Anticipate the Lord's response that if we cast that care and we cast that burden upon him, anticipate what God can do with your personal life. Anticipate that you can live free, that you can live completely forgiven, that you can live lift, walking on a lighter foot and walking with a, he, a lighter heart instead of a heavy heart and a heavy foot. To really believe and anticipate that the Lord's response to our casting of our burden is going to be good, that it's going to be refreshing that's going to be new. So as we think about these lessons for our heart, we said the burdens that are common to life. We also said, you know, part of that, casting our burden upon the Lord, acknowledging our weakness, releasing to the Lord, anticipate his response. But number three, let me go back to the lessons of the heart that David teaches us in this psalm, is that God will help you, that God will help us. So when we cast these cares upon him, know that his help is there. He's not going to say, I'll get back with you in the morning or put you on hold or say, I'll, give, I'll set up an appointment and let you know in a week how I'll handle it. No, he will help you at the moment you cry out to him. It is not 
a, a wait and see what God will do. It is a sustainment of, his, of himself in your life. I love the, uh, the commentary about this one uh, part of the, the psalm where David says, I call upon the Lord. The Lord will save me. In the latter part, he says, I will trust in you. That word trust is another word translated as sustained. It's a word we probably don't use a lot in our own English vocabulary, which means to sustain us is to be supplied with an ample amount of food for our bodies. Now apply it spiritually to that sustainment. It is that he will sustain us and he will provide everything we need in our life. As we throw our care upon him, he supplies our need according to his riches and glory. And as a result, he sustains us. He fills us. He helps us. He, he interacts with us spiritually and he provides everything that we need as an individual to live in relationship to him because God will help us. Casting our burden upon him. Why? Because we matter to God and he's ready to help us. Rather, it's a promise that God will give what we need to make it through the circumstance to fulfill our responsibility and to live with our memory. That he will help us to be sustained as we acknowledge our weakness, we release it to him, and we anticipate his response by giving us help. When David cast the burden of his circumstance on, Lord, on the Lord, Ahithophel was still in alliance with Absalom. He still had the responsibility of the kingdom. He still had the plaguing memory of his past failures with Bathsheba. But God brought him through to a better day and God will bring you and I through to a better day. The fourth lesson of the heart is that God will establish you. That he will establish us. And he says... And he will never let the righteous fall. In other words, translated from, from this verse that, that David is speaking about, he says that he will not let the righteous fall. He will not let the righteous be moved. This promise rules out the possibility of failure and defeat. Cast your care upon God because he cares for you and he's going to watch you fail. Is that what that scripture says? No, that's not the promise. The promise is that as we cast our care upon him, we anticipate his response and his response is so that we will succeed and we will fulfill what God has called us to do, that he will not see us fail. He doesn't want us to be destroyed. He wants our faith to be sustained. He wants it to be strong. He wants us to look to him greater than we ever have. He wants us to depend on him greater than we ever depended. So he's not setting us for failure. He's setting us up for success. And when we throw our cares upon him, he says, now you're ready for me to do something and I'm getting ready to establish you for who you are. That's powerful. But you know what? It's not going to happen until we stand on the seashore of our own life and we reach into our heart and we get rid of the crud that's there. And when we get rid of the crud, we'll realize that it's really beautiful music that we've been needing in our life. The music of his sweet angelic hand upon our life. The sweet music of his touch, of his fresh anointing in our life. The beautiful freshness of God being real in our life. In the end, the will of God has to be done. In the end for David's life, the will of God was accomplished. You remember what happened? God brought David through the rebellion of Absalom. He allowed him to have the privilege of putting the crown on the head of God's next chosen successor in that of Solomon. In the end, God will see those things get done. But not because of David's ability and not because of my ability and not because of your ability. It is God who works anew and afresh because he is faithful. And he is true to his word. In life, it is a continuing experience of the sufficiency of God being real in our life and establishing us for who we are. Just when you need it. What you need is there. And what I need is there. 
Blessed be his good name and his sufficient hand forever. Our life experiences teach us it's not a once in a lifetime experience. Rather, it is an experience that's repeated over and over throughout our life, if not daily. Life with its demands crowds upon us and the burdens begin to press down. And so every day we've got to go, we've got to be casting forth those burdens, casting forth those cares and giving them to God. So what do you do? Do you run and hide and seek to escape? Or do you turn to the Lord of love and cast your burden upon him? Not burdens, but your burden. What looks like multiple is singular to God. And will you cast your burden upon him? Hopefully you and I will agree to take counsel in the word of God, to cast our burden upon the Lord. He will not fail us, nor will he allow us to fail as well. Thanks be unto God that he's all about a fishing experience of our life. He wants us to cast it into the deep water, the deep water of his heart, and allow him to take all the junk that we give him, all the anxiety moments of our life that we have, all the burdens that we carry, all the sadness that we have, all the emotions that we experience, all the failures and sin of our life, he wants us to cast all of that burden upon him because he wants to do something grand with who we are. So will you turn to the Lord and cast your burden on the one who loves you? Thanks be unto God that there's nothing that I can give him that's going to shock him. And there's nothing that I can say to him that's going to turn him away. And there's nothing that I can ever do to cause him to hide his face from who I am. Thanks be unto God for one who's willing to take what I give him and do something grand. Will you do that? How do you do that? Bow where you are, wherever you're at your home, in this very building. Just bow your heads and say to God, God, I give you all my cares and I place them in your heart to do something miraculous. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for allowing us to hear what we all need to hear today, to be encouraged in our life, to understand friendship with you is beyond just a good feeling of knowing that we have someone who loves us, but a friendship that's so deep that we confide with the innermost secrets of our heart, with the God of this universe, knowing that you can take your mighty hand and change whatever's wrong in our life. Father, thank you that you can take all those cares, all those burdens, all those concerns, all this anxiety, all this emotion that I have, and do something wonderful. Father, thank you for helping me to realize it's my responsibility to cast it. And they also realize that it's your responsibility to do with what I cast and to leave it there with you. Father, thank you for new life. Thank you for abundant life that we have fresh in you every day. Encourage us this, this day to lean upon you, not upon our own understanding, and to trust in your way and not in our own to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and know that your riches from glory is powerful than any riches we could ever have in this life and to know that as we cast our cares upon you, you love us so and we matter. Thank you, Father, for all that you do. In your name that we pray, amen. Wherever you've been, come broken hearted, let the rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal.
was the sorrow that heaven gave you. Lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your There's hope for the helpless and all those who've strayed. Can sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary and rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven. your burdens, lay down your shame, through all who are broken, lift up your face, the wonder and come home, you're not too far, so lay down your burden, lay down your as you are, come as you are. Come out of sadness, wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let the rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal.